time. It cost me something. It cost my soul something. It cost my physical being something. And I want to be obedient to, to everything that God has in this moment. I want it. I want it all because it cost me something to be here. Hallelujah. It cost me something. I said it cost me something. Amen. You can be seated. You stood long enough. I want to thank my brother from another mother. We got the same father, Jehovah. But my brother from another mother, if I had to go into a service with only one musician, it would be you. Praise God. Praise God. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. 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 You see, for me, this all started with a question from God. And I want to ask you the same question. First, God asked me, will you make room? And I want to ask you today, will you make room? Will you make room? Will you make room for God? Will you make room for His Spirit? Will you make room for His glory? Because as I've read this week those accounts of the Azusa Street Revival, they had three services a day on Sunday. They had a morning, they had an afternoon, and they had an evening. But they said for those three years after the glory came, it never really stopped. People were always in the building praying, even through the night. And the morning service would blend into the afternoon service, and the afternoon service would blend into the evening service, and some people would stay all day, and some people would come and go. But the glory came. They made room for God. They made room for God. And I'm asking you, will you make room for God? Will you make room for more? Will you make room for the miraculous? Will you make room for the mysterious? Will you make room for the new? Will you make room for God? That regardless of what transpires and what takes place, you decide here and now, I'm drawing the line of demarcation. I'm not going to be the same. I'm never going to be the same. I am making room for God. If God tells me to go, I go. If God tells me to stay, I stay. If God says eat, I eat. If God says fast, I fast. If God says witness, I witness. If God says keep your mouth shut and do not open your mouth, I keep my mouth shut and I do not open my mouth. Will you make room? And that's where I want to go in my first point. Will you make room for me? That's what God is asking. Will you make room for me? In the book of Mark... Chapter 4, there's an interesting parable there. And I won't go into all of these verses that I've prepared, but it's the parable of the sower. And in verse 3, Jesus himself says, Listen, behold, a sower went out to sow. And he's sowing seed. And in verse 7 it says, Some seed fell among thorns. And the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no crop. And it yielded no crop. Verse 8 says, But other seed fell on good ground, and it yielded a crop. That sprang up. I want you to see this. Both the thorns and the harvest are growing. And it sprang up, increased, and produced some 30, 
some 60, some 100 fold. I want you to listen to me. I want you to hear what I'm about to tell you. In verse number 14, the sower sowed the word. The seed is the word. But the harvest is not determined by the seed. The same seed fell by the wayside, fell on rocky soil, fell among thorny soil, and fell on good ground. The seed does not determine the harvest. The soil of your heart determines the harvest. Whether there is a harvest, whether Satan steals the harvest before it even has a chance to take root, whether the thorns of this life choke out the harvest or the harvest, that seed finds good ground. You and I determine that. God does not determine that. I want you to look in the 18th verse. Now these are the ones sown among thorns. They are the ones who hear the word. And the cares of this world. The deceitfulness of riches. And the desire for other things. Entering in. Choke the word. And it becomes unfruitful. It becomes unfruitful. You see, the question goes back to, will you make room for me? That's what God is asking each and every one of us. Will you make room for me? Will you make room for the seed of my word? Will you make room for the harvest in your life? That which I have purposed for you. You see, somehow in this world, we've got it all mixed up. We think destiny is automatic. That all I got to do is be born and my destiny is automatic. No, God has purposes. Just like he had for Israel in Jeremiah 29, 11, I know the thoughts I think toward thee, says the Lord. Thoughts of good and not of evil to give you a, a future and a hope or in some translations an expected end. But you have to choose God and you have to choose that seed. You see, here's what I've discovered in, in, in my life and in this season. That God is tired of competing with other things. I know we get hung up on that word deceitfulness of riches. Oh, I'm not after that, so that I'm okay. Don't miss the other things in that verse. Go ahead and put that, that verse back up. Is it 18 or 19? Whichever one it is. Other things. The cares of the world. Deceitfulness of riches. And other things. They choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. Listen, you will have a blade. You will have a stalk. It will be green, but it will have no fruit. You will have a form of godliness, but you will have denied the power thereof. You'll be like the fig tree that Jesus cursed. You'll have false advertisement. Because if a fig tree had leaves, a fig tree had fruit. But something had happened in that fig tree. Something had short-circuited. It had allowed something else to take up the ground along with it. And the life-giving nutrients that were supposed to flow out of that soil were flowing into something else. I don't know about you, but you don't got to plant weeds. You ain't got to plant thorns. You ain't got to plant thistles. They're there. You got to do something to keep them from being there. You got to be proactive to get them out of your garden, to get them out of your life. Because if not, they will suck the nutrients out of the soil and you will have small fruit or you will have no fruit. God is saying, 
I am tired of competing for space in your life. This is why Jesus said, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you. That's Matthew 6, What are the things? What to wear, what to eat, what to drink, where to live. All the concerns of our life, all of the basic needs of our life. Jesus said, I want to be in first place. Because here's what I've learned. Here's what I know. If God is not in first place, then he becomes adversarial against everything else that is in front of him. Listen, I know we live in the New Testament era of grace. I understand that. But Exodus 20 still says that I am the Lord God. Right? You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make any graven images of anything in the heavens or on earth or in the sea. The Bible goes on to tell us that this God is a jealous God. All this this one commandment that we've boiled down, this one commandment that there is one God and that we should have no other God but Him is all boiled down into this understanding in verse 5, Exodus 20, verse 5. For I, the Lord, thy God, am a jealous God. I visit the iniquities of the children, I mean of the fathers, to the third and fourth generation. Listen to this. But I show mercy to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. God is adversarial against anything. And he's saying to you, weed your garden. Do you hear me? God is saying, weed your garden. If not, your life will be unfruitful. Make room for me. Second point I want to make. Is make room for more. Make room for more. In Isaiah, there's an interesting passage. In Isaiah 54, 1. Here God is instructing a barren woman to sing. This lady who has never given birth, this lady who has no children, he's saying to her, sing, O barren. Break forth into singing and pray. Praise and pray. Cry aloud. You have not labored with child, for more are the children of the desolate than the children of the married woman, says the Lord. And he goes on. Enlarge the place of your tent. And let them stretch out the curtains of your dwellings. Do not spare. Lengthen your cords and strengthen your stakes. Why? Throw that up there. Why? Why do I need to do that? Verse 3. For you shall expand to the right and to the left. And your descendants will inherit the nations and make the desolate cities Inhabited. You see, making room for more means making room for enlargement and expansion. You see, when I read this scripture, I immediately thought of David's tabernacle. And I mentioned this the other day. But one of the promises to the seven churches is that God is going to restore the tabernacle of David. You see, the tabernacle of David, God had taken, I mean, David had taken the most holy place. And he had brought the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem. And he had set it in the middle of the tent. And he raised up the tent flaps. And from north, south, east, west, everyone had access to God. 
and God had access to everyone. Oh, I feel the Holy Ghost. Listen, in Moses' tabernacle, Aaron and his sons could only enter the holy place one time. And they could only go in with blood. And they had to crawl in. Later on, the Bible would tell us of priests after Aaron and his sons. They'd have to tie a rope to their leg and put bells on their pants. That way, if they heard jingling, they would know he was still alive. But if it got quiet, they'd drag him out. But David said, The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Access. Everyone had access. I would hate to keep mentioning this Azusa Street. Revival. No, I don't hate to. I just, I just, you, if you get tired of it, just tune me out. You see, that was the thing about Azusa Street. Every race was accepted, everyone was equal. Frank Bartleman, a white man, would write of this revival. Had this meeting came, and he names the church, I'm not going to name the church, he said, we would have never heard of it. Because it was a total Caucasian congregation. But because it came to this church. Where there was an African American pastor. Where there was no color line. They said the color line dissolved in the blood of Jesus. That was a direct quote from the Azusa revival. Because all races had access to God. And God had access to all races. A glory cloud fell on that place. And God dwelt there for three years. You want to know what ended that revival? Division. Division is what eventually destroyed the Azusa revival. When people began to clamor and they wanted their voice heard over other people's voice and they wanted to be important and they they wanted to be the one to be in charge and they wanted to run things. And Seymour, a humble man, the pastor of the church, said, okay, do what you got to do. Didn't fight with anybody, didn't. Well, we make room for more. Part of that more that we need to make room for is new, the new. The new. Remember, God has been telling us, behold, I do a new thing. Isaiah 43, 19. Behold, I do a new thing. What's a new thing? It's an unheard of thing. It's a fresh thing. It's a right now, right here thing. God is saying to us, He's asking us, make room for the new. I found this verse in Leviticus 26.10. In the King James it says, You shall eat of the old harvest and clear out the old because of the new. I said, wow, that's interesting. What does that mean? So I looked it up in the NLT. You will have a surplus of crops that you will need to clear out the old grain to make room for the new harvest. One translation says you will eat of the old until the new comes. And then you will clear out the old and the new will come in. You see, we have to be willing to make room for the new. We have to be willing to say some things are old and some things had their season and some things had their time and now there's something new that God is doing. I need to make room for more. I need to make room for that new thing that God wants to do in me. I need to make room for that. That old thing, I don't hate it. 
I'm not against it. It got me where I am. It brought me to this place in God, but I no longer need it. It's kind of like Paul said, when I was a child, I spake as a child, I understood as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. I'm not saying the oldest child is here what I'm saying. It's time for the new thing. It's time for the new thing, and we need to make room for the new thing. We need to make room for the new thing. Let me go to my third point. We need to make room for the miraculous. We need to make room for the miraculous. Not only do we need to make room for God, not only do we need to make room for more, we need to make room for the miraculous. In 2 Kings 4, 18 through 17, I'm not going to read all these verses. I just want you to hear about it. There's this Shunammite woman. She's a notable woman. She's a woman of means. She's a woman of influence. And she persuaded Elisha to eat food at her table because he passed by there often. She says, husband, we need to do something for this man of God. We need to build a room on our house. We need to put a chair there, a table there, a bed there, and a candlestick there. We need to make room for the man of God because he passes by often. Wow. Wow. Verse 11. And it happened one day that he came there and he turned into the upper room and he lay down and he said to Gehazi, I call the Shunammite woman. When, she, when he called her, she stood before him and he said, look, you've been concerned about us with all this care. What can I do for you? So he starts asking her, what can I do for you? She said, I don't need anything. So she leaves. And then Gehazi says in verse 14, actually, she has no son and her husband is old. Gehazi starts thinking about the future. He starts thinking about the future. He said, this lady's husband is old, and she's going to need somebody to take care of her. She doesn't have a son. So look at this. So he said, call her. And when he had called her, she stood in the doorway. She is standing in the doorway of what was and what will be. And God is asking each and every one of us, will you make room for the miraculous? Will you make room for the miraculous? You are standing in the doorway of what has been, and you're standing on the verge of what will be. And because this lady made room for the man of God, God gave her a child. And not only did God give her a child, when the child died, God gave the child back to her again. And not only did God give the child back to her again, after there was a famine in 2 Kings 8, and she had to leave the country. Excuse me, the famine is in 6 and 7. But in chapter 8, when she returned, the king, same Gehazi, said, here's the woman, here's her son. The king gave her back her land because she made room for the man of God because she made room for the miraculous she got a son she got her son raised again she lost her land and she got her land back she made room for the miraculous now before anybody thinks I'm preaching build me a, an addition on your house because I'm coming to live with you don't think that you see Simon Peter you know, the Apostle Peter. He made room for the miraculous when he made room for Jesus in his house and on his boat. I wish somebody would get a hold of this. I said, I wish somebody would get a hold of this. In the book of Mark, chapter 1, 29 through 34, the Bible says they entered the house of Simon, Andrew, and James, and John. Simon's mother lay sick of a fever. And they told him about her at once. So she came and took, so he came and took her by the hand and lifted her up, and immediately the fever left, and she served them. And then in Luke 5, Jesus got in Simon's boat in verse 3. 
he preaches a sermon. And in verse 4, he says, launch out into the deep and let down the nets. And I'm going to close with this point, Taylor. Let down the nets. And Peter says, Master, we have toiled all night. But nevertheless, at thy word. Is there anyone in here that's got some nevertheless faith? Is there anyone in here that's got some the nevertheless faith? God, I've made room for you. God, I've made, I, I, I've made room for more. I'm making room for the miraculous. I'm inviting you in my house. I'm inviting you in my life. I'm inviting you in my business. I've done everything I know to do to get well. I've done everything I know to do to lead my kids to Christ. I've done everything I know to do to pay my bills. I've done everything I know to do. But nevertheless, at your word, I'm going to make room for the miraculous. I'm going to make room for the miraculous. I'm going to make room for the miraculous. Is anybody here going to make room for the miraculous today? I'm going to make room for the miraculous Let's just stand to our feet and sing for a little bit before I call you to the altar.